Hey all, Brie from the No Guilt Mom podcast, and I have got a gift for you this holiday season. If you love the No Guilt Mom podcast, and I mean love the No Guilt Mom podcast, then tell us about it. Leave us a review and you can be entered to win a No Guilt Mom gift card. All you have to do is leave a review, take a screenshot, and then simply go to noguiltmom.com forward slash review to enter our giveaway for a free No Guilt Mom gift card. Simply for telling us what you think about the podcast. It is amazing. But don't delay. Get right on this as we're going to be giving away that No Guilt Mom gift card on December 21st. So get right on over and visit noguiltmom.com forward slash review. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. I am your host, Joanne Crone, joined by my co-host, Brie Tucker. Well, hello, hello, everybody. How are you? We we have such an interesting conversation for you today. It is with Amy Lang, who has been a sexual health educator for over 25 years. And just to let you know, there's a very frank conversation about sex in this it, episode. It is very down and dirty. It had a lot of great information for parents, but I don't know if you necessarily want to listen to it with your kids around. I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it might be it might be a little uncomfortable, especially if you haven't like heard the episode first, and you know, everything that we're talking about. I mean, because we go from everything from sexuality, masturbation, mm-hmm. porn, everything. Yeah. yeah. And I don't say like I wouldn't watch listen to it with my kids out of like a shame. It's more of like. I wouldn't listen because I would feel so uncomfortable, (laughs) which we also talk about in the episode, like our own, like part of the problem of trying to get over these conversations with our kids is just dealing with our own shit. Yeah, we have to deal with our own stuff. So we hope you enjoy our conversation with Amy Lang. You want mom life to be easier. That's our goal too. Our mission is to raise more self-sufficient and independent kids and we're going to have fun doing it. We're going to help you delegate and step back. Each episode, we'll tackle strategies for positive discipline, making our kids more responsible and making our lives better in the process. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. Welcome, Amy, to the No Guilt Mom podcast. Brie and I were just listening to your podcast uh, this morning, and we loved it. I laughed, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the kind of talk that parents need about talking to their kids about sex. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It is uh, like such an amazing thing that you do, giving information to parents when they're really uncomfortable about having the talk. I'm curious, how did you get into this? Excellent question. So my, I got into this through shame and embarrassment, (laughs) you know? Um, so I had been a sex educator for about 16 years and I'd been doing all the usual teenager, like birth control, abortion, you know, condoms, STIs, that kind of thing. Totally loved it. It was actually my hobby. It's what I did for fun. And I had just assumed I was going to be a total rock star when I had kids. I thought, all right, I love this stuff. It comes to me naturally. It's in my bones. And then Milo, um, he was about five and he grabbed his penis and he said, Hey mama, did you know? And I stood there and I thought, please don't tell me it feels good to touch your penis. And I did the poker face. Right. And I said, what? And he said, I can see the veins in there where the blood goes. And I said, great, get in the bathtub. And that was my moment where I thought, oh, great. You do not know what you're doing. I was freaking out. I had no, I I, give me a pregnant 15 year old. I can rock that. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a very tough situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I started doing some research for, you know, our family. And as I was doing that, I realized that I could help other parents. I have a master's degree and my focus was in adult education. So I combined my two favorite things, teaching adults and talking about sex. And here we are. And my child is now 21. So he's all grown and man-childing and appears great. You know, (laughs) I know, right? You don't ever want to say things are going fantastic because that's when that other shoe drops. So you're like, it it seems to be going okay so far, but you know, hey, we're open. (laughs) And I imagine like you must have like an even more complicated way of talking about your kids since you're like a sex educator, especially like teaching parents how to talk to kids about sex. I know like we're here, even on the podcast, just being parenting, we have to be very careful about what we say about our kids in like terms of not embarrassing them. But I would say you have an extra layer on it 
that would be hard. Yeah. yeah, I have permission to tell like the stories I tell about him. I have permission to tell them. And also the other side of it, he just doesn't really care. So <laughs> He just doesn't really care. I mean, he's grown and he's sort of done with it. I mean, he was so embarrassed by me for so long. And then when he got into high school, he said, I suddenly had some cred because I had this funky kind of cool job. So all his friends called me Amy Lang. So, you know, he came around. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Your experience of dealing with sex education reminds me of our friend Shana's who like her job in college was teaching college students about sex. And she carried around a banana around campus and taught everyone how to put on a condom. And she's saying this like, and we're like, oh my gosh, I couldn't, couldn't imagine. But no, just, no. This, Having grown up in the Bible belt of, uh, you know, the US, it was, it was a little bit more, uh, you know, don't talk about it. <laughs> People acted like if they didn't. And I love that. Like when I was listening to your podcast, you have a really great point that not talking about it doesn't make it not exist. Mm -hmm. And you, I was just listening to one of the episodes where you were talking about uh, the monitoring and um, how to keep track of things that are going on online because you can be prepared. You can talk to your kids about it and everything. And, but that doesn't suddenly make it just doesn't make the risk factors disappear. Mm -mm. They still are there. No. Yeah, totally. And yeah, I mean, there's just an article in the paper about an 11 year old girl who was on discord and Roblox. And I actually had a consultation with a family, a parent that this girl got, groomed by multiple people, multiple people. She had no idea what she was doing. The parents didn't understand how those two things worked. Mm -hmm. And so just to circle back, when you're having open conversations with your kids about sexuality, which includes like watching out for tricky people and understanding that it's not like nobody asks, no healthy person asks these kinds of questions of a young person. So it really, there really is this whole connection back to safety, right? And my whole thing is this is a just about health and safety. That's it. End of the day. Yeah. It's our only job. That is our yeah. only job. It's not our job to give our kids phones. It's not our job to make sure they're eating while well, eating, you know, decent food is our job, but there's so much stuff that we fret about and worry about that we forget that at the end of the day, it's just these two things. And there's so much now that is not about that, right? It's not about that. And it doesn't help. It is about safety. And it's really hard as a parent to navigate that, especially in the tech landscape, because we didn't grow up with this. Most of us did not. And it's hard to figure out what's okay online, like in terms of programs, in terms of what to let kids play with, in terms of what's safe and what's what's not okay online. And I know you mentioned a lot about monitoring and tracking. What can parents do? How can they start if they have nothing in place right now in terms of monitoring and tracking their kids online? Well, the first thing is you just need to understand you know, my universe around this is around porn. Your child will see pornography before they make it to 18, 100% guaranteed. So no one needs to, well, I know people, grown up people like to see people like that. I don't, I look once a year and I'm always like, and I can't do it. Um, I actually looked twice this year accidentally in a short period of time. Um, so the first thing is you have to understand that they are going to see pornography. We talk about the internet. It's the world wide web. We go online, we go there for everything, right? It's the Oracle. So if you're not talking with them openly about sexuality, they're going to go Google penis. They're going to Google boobs. And if you're bored and you're listening to this, whip out your phone, Google penis, mm -hmm. can't see things. There's photos on there. Oh, yeah. I it's mean, easy to get to videos, right? It's like a heartbeat. So, you know, so the place to start is using monitoring and filtering. And their the product I like the most is called Bark. And it's easy to install. You can use it from your phone. You can shut things off. You can turn things on. And you have to do that. It's not a choice anymore. There are, you can use the thingies in your computer and whatever devices they're on. They're not as effective and it's a pain in the ass. So if you can afford a one-stop shop, I recommend that. Um, if you're outside of the U.S., Custodio is, um, is the option there. And so, you know, people are like, oh, but... They're, my child would never, and mm -hmm. oh, they're too young. They're not curious. And it's like, that's just BS. Yeah. It's just straight up BS. So one way I like to talk about this is to think about being in a car, right? So when you're in a car, no matter how old your kid is, there are two things that are happening. So when they're a baby, they're in a bucket and they're always wearing a seatbelt in some way. So the seatbelt is monitoring. You're always using monitoring, which means you're just watching where they're going. You're seeing where they're going. That's the seatbelt, the car seat, the bucket, that's filtering. So the younger they are, the tighter, right? So in a bucket, when you're a little, when you're a baby, then do you get turned around? I can't even remember anymore. Then you get turned around in the bucket, maybe then you get a car seat, rear facing, forward facing, booster, front seat driving, right? 
mm-hmm. the whole time there's a seatbelt, but you get, they get more autonomy as they get older and they're eventually sitting in the front seat where they just, just wear the seatbelt. So monitoring and filtering is the same, super tight when they're little, super duper tight when they're little, by the time they are in the sixth grade, they should be able to go anywhere they want online, but you're always watching. So if they do go to a porn site or that awful, like, you know, drug site or worse, you'll see it. And then you have a conversation and, you know, this, the, we have to change our thinking about this. Like, just like you'd never let your kid get in a car or you'd never go in a car without a seatbelt. You have to do the same thing for your kids when it comes to this. So it's just, yeah, it's hard on me that people don't believe me. So do what you will. It's your kid, your choice. But just remember that if the first place your kid learns about sex is from porn, you're setting them up for some trouble. Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of porn, first of all, pornography depicts women in very unhealthy ways as yeah. well as just being like, it, it just puts all these unrealistic expectations and it's just degrades them. And it's awful from that standpoint, as well as many others that informs hor- like horrible ideas about sex and what sex is and not for intimacy or whatever. So that aside, it's kind of like, We're in this age where there is so much information that is just available right at our fingertips. And I mean, when we were kids, it was always the, if the parent had a playboy in the house at the slumber party, everybody would be like, oh my gosh, guess what I found? (laughs) Or a penthouse. Oh my God. Oh my God. Penthouse was like the most scandalous, the most scandalous. Yeah. And now like everything is just available. And I think the scary thing is that it's almost like you're able to reach someone else and talk to them online. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. like the magazines like we had or we found uh, were you couldn't communicate, you couldn't interact. And nowadays, like you can interact with people. Mm -hmm. If if, especially if you're not sure like what your kids are using and the capabilities of the Mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. My son is playing a game right now on his computer where he's a thief and the cops are after him. So I'm so excited about this new app, Give As We Grow, where instead of being the quote unquote bad guys, kids are practicing giving back. That is so cool, Joanne. I really wish that there was something like this when my kids were younger that got them excited about giving back to others and helped them build a better understanding of what it really means to volunteer. Give As We Grow is the first of its kind free educational mobile app for children ages 8 to 11 that teaches kids via fun, service-focused mini game quests to tap into their unique talents and interests to help others. And did you know that studies show that there is a biological connection between generosity and happiness and that volunteering improves people's physical and mental health? I mean, kids who volunteer typically do better in school and are less likely to engage in risky behaviors. And that is something that I think we all want for our kids. Ready to spark a new movement in generosity? Find and download Give As We Grow for free in the App Store for Android and iOS. And for resources for the whole family, visit giveaswegrow.org. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. It is so hard to raise kids who know how to manage money. Brie, right now, my kids are all about earning money for presents. My daughter wants to get presents for all of her friends, and my son is doing a secret Santa with his friends. Oh, I hear you. And if you're looking to raise kids that are financially responsible, we have got a lifesaver recommendation for you that you need to check out. It is Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families that gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy all while giving parents peace of mind. You can send instant money transfers, automate allowance, and even keep an eye on kids' spending with real-time notifications. Meanwhile, your kids can begin their journey towards financial autonomy by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. So sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash NGM. That's greenlight.com slash NGM to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash NGM. Mm-hmm. And you know, those flat, like looking at a photograph is nothing compared to watching a video. It's better, right? And so sometimes I recommend for parents, you know, that they do give alternatives. So, and, you know, Playboy, Playgirl, they're not in print anymore, but you can get back issues. It's much better for a child if they're, and this is a total like family values choice. Mm -hmm. If that feels right to you, then give them that sexy novels, like books. There's all kinds of safer ways to get your rocks off. Not that anyone wants to think about that with their kids, but there's, there are, there are ways you can kind of mitigate that. And, um, 
And yeah, what they see in the videos, they think that's how you do sex. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because they that's what that's they see. How you do sex, right. It's and porn starts in the middle and nobody's penis is that big. And <laughs> there's no, they're all hairless. And last time they're I checked, there was no delivery guy that came to my house and was like, here's my package. <laughs> no, like, well, come on, let's have a storyline. No, it's just like banging it out. Um, oh my gosh. So just one thing that I think is also helpful for parents to know just in terms of sexuality education. So up until they are, kids are about like, I can never remember, like 13 ish parents have the most influence over them in terms of their sexual health, their sexual education, their sexual identity. We have, we are the most powerful, um, peers are way down here. So then, as you may recall, as they get into high school, their peers and the parents were still neck and neck, but the peers are actually a little bit higher in terms of their influence. So if you get the sex talk started sooner, like starting at five, starting in kindergarten, doing it throughout, keeping it up, even when they're doing the old talk to the hand thing, you're, you have this place in this space where you establish yourself as an expert. They'll be more likely to come to you. They'll be more open to the conversation. And so by the time they're in those high school years, you're in there, you're in their brains and you've talked about your values. And so the peer stuff's going to be coming at them, um, which is fine. But if you know, you've really worked hard to make sure that they, and my whole goal, like with Milo was, I want him to be the smartest kid on the playground. Like that should be your goal. Smartest kid on the playground. And even town crier, right? Like most people are like, oh no, if I tell my child the penis goes in the vagina, are they going to go tell everyone? And I'm like, A, probably not. And B, if someone says, you know, sex is when you kiss with tongues and your kid's like, okay, not so much. Not so, yeah. I love what what you said about them being the smartest kid on the playground. That's something that I think like I... I've done with my daughter. However, like kids have different personalities. And my son is one of those shut down, like don't want to talk about it, totally embarrassed. And it's harder to have those conversations. So how do it's you... harder to start that? Yeah. So yeah. so do you have any advice on like how do you how do you break through those that have the tougher shell? The ones that every time you try to talk to it, they just are like, nope. Stop, mom. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. So my child told me that he would rather talk to strangers than me or his dad about sex. Sounds like my kids. Also- okay. <laughs> and also told me that um, he would never ask us a question. So, and here I am, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. great. Like I have all this information and, you know, it's like, a, you know, I have to, you know, put my professional hat on, but I have this whole thing going on in my own household. So here are some things. So first of all, if you have a kiddo that is very reticent, there's some things you can do. So first of all, uh, use the world around you. So you're watching a show together and there's an interaction between um, a couple and you're like, in your head, you're like, oh, that was not good. Then you just say, hey, remember when we were watching Never Have I Ever, which is my current favorite show for people to watch with their children. Um, and this happened. Um, you know, I really, I didn't like that. It felt X, Y, Z to me. And then you always say, did you notice? What'd you think? And they say, Meh-uh. right? They, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And what you're doing is you're sprinkling in, right? You're sprinkling in. So use the world around you. Um, use your other kids. So if you have older, younger kid, and usually what hap- happens is the older child will not talk and the younger child is chatty. I've seen this over and over again. So capitalize on the chatty, curious ch- kiddo. So just talk about stuff in front of the other kid. Um the other thing to do too is to um, use your timer and just say, look, I need two minutes, two minutes of your time, set your timer, you say your thing, um, and then you've done your thing. Get them books, um, bribe them. Um, I, I use all the tools. I know you're like positive discipline person, right? And I've had my, I am too. And my, there are people like, bro, I've never. And I'm like, oh no, no, um, no. All the tools in the toolbox. Um, oh yeah. And then the other thing you can do for yourself and for your child, which is really helpful, is there's a thing you want to talk about, like masturbation, okay? So what you can do is say, and I did this with Milo on the regular, hey, there's a sex thing I want to talk to you about. We can do it now or do it later. Guess what they always say? Do it now. No. (laughs) No, really? Say it later. Really? Oh, oh my yeah. gosh, my kid my kids won't like they will not yeah. put so off everybody's agony. Different. So if they say <laughs> yeah. later, then you're like, great, I've got some time. If they say now, you need to be ready. You need to be good to go. And not just to toot my own horn, my new book, Sex Talks with Tweens, is all scripts, basically. So you memorize the little masturbation script, which I will give to you right now. And then um you say, so in the moment you just do it. If it's later, you have within 48 hours, you need to find that moment and say, hey, okay, it's later. And then just t- 
talk about it. So you want me to talk about masturbation? Go for yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I have this formula, which is facts and values and limits. So the facts about masturbation, uh, masturbation is when someone, uh, touch, r- touches and rubs their penis or clitoris because it feels good for pleasure, right? It's something you don't have to do. It's something, you know, you can choose to do or not to do. It's also something people do together when they're in a sexual relationship. Okay. Values total fan. It's really important to learn your body. It helps you understand, you know, what feels good to you in a sexual way. So later on when you're in your what late twenties and have your first sexual relationships, (laughs) then you, then you, you have a sense of what feels good to you and then limits, you know, I just would say something like, you know, if you're doing this, it's something you do in private when you're alone in the bedroom or in your bathroom. And again, it's not something you have to do. Um, but I would encourage you to feel what figure out, figure out what feels good to you. And then, so that's that. In particular, people with clitorises, they need to be told straight up, get to know that part of your body because its only job is pleasure, nothing else. Mm-hmm. You know, all the other crap we people with clitorises have to put up with, we got that bonus. I don't know if it balances out, but um, <laughs> yeah. So so you see that little succinct, succinct, succinct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they are going to do what they're going to do with it. They may say, do you do that? And you can say... You know, it's a healthy part of being a human being. Look at that shiny thing over there. You can also just say, do you really want to know the answer to that? And they will probably say no. No. Um, um, Because nobody wants to think about their parents' sex life in any way, shape, or form. So that, those things, right? And you just have to do it so they get used to it. And just say to them, I get it, you're uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. You have to know about this part of life. Mm -hmm. And it feels really good to be smarter than everyone. Yes, indeed. True. Yeah. That's a good point. Be like, I'm giving you knowledge, man. You're going to be the go-to person. You're going to be the one that knows it all. And I love your scripts because I, so I am comfortable at a fifth grade level talking about sex because I used to have to teach human growth and development as a fifth grade teacher. And the way our school district did is you had a script and you cannot deviate from that script. And reading from that script was so helpful because you didn't have to put any personal interpretations in it. So I love that you gave a script for that because I'm like, oh, it's reading from a script. I don't. I think that helps. It gives you that extra, like you were talking about how, like I'm laughing at everything you're saying because like I have a 14 and a 15 year old right now. So like we've been through a lot of this and I'm also like on my second marriage and my husband now has a different perspective of it than my my ex did. So like it's, it's a parenting mind shift I'm having going on, but I get nervous. Like so many parents do. And I think that that the idea of having a script definitely mm-hmm. gives you that that self confidence of like okay at least I'm going to know what I need to say because that's the scariest part I think it's just yeah. having the talk and not knowing what you're going to say mm-hmm. right and nobody talked to us right right oh, oh gosh right? yeah no I mean the hand, some people definitely had really good relationships and had a lot of information but nobody talked to us. So we didn't even have an example. I mean, we don't even have examples of how to parent, but that's another story. Like we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have an example of how to do this and how to do it well, right? And um, you know, and I think in general in parenting, you know, we also were raised in a way where most of the time our parents were never vulnerable or not or vulnerable. I don't know. My parents were not vulnerable at all ever. Um, but saying to your kiddo, you know, I'm uncomfortable talking about this, but just saying it, I'm uncomfortable. I'm probably gonna screw it up, but here you go. And you say the thing. And, you know, one of the lovely things about having people who are over the age of 12 is you do not need to edit screen. You can say all the things, all the words, just, just don't worry about it. It was so glorious when Milo was, I'm like, all right, thank God. I don't have to be so careful with you anymore. And again, that kind of just circles back to where we started with the porn talk, right? You got to get in there first. You know, you're going to do the best you can right? You're going to do the best you can, but there, this is something that you can learn to do and it's fun and funny, right? I yeah, mean, it is sex, funny. sex is fun, right? Sex is fun. It should be fun. And that's one of the messages our kids don't get, right? They get this sort of, like we did this sort of gloom and doom and don't do it. You're going to get in trouble. There are all these problems. I mean, imagining the sex ed curriculum you were teaching was very mm-hmm. like neg- negative. It was I mean, by the book. It was very anatomical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really. yeah. yeah. So that's the other thing that I think is really important is that we quit thinking about this in terms of prevention, right? Yeah. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. It's preparation. Like, don't you want your kids be, to be prepared for this part of life? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, I wasn't. 
Hey all, Brie here, and I wanted to share one of my favorite gifts to give during the holiday season, a StoryWorth book. It is the most amazing gift ever. StoryWorth is an online service that lets you create a special and unique gift of someone's story. I've given StoryWorth books to both of my parents, and it has been their favorite gift, hands down. And did I mention, it is so easy. StoryWorth emailed my parents questions every week that I handpicked from their massive list of questions that they have. All my parents had to do was open their email and answer them. That easy. I asked my dad questions like, did you have any rules that you set for yourself as a parent, which you immediately broke? And he did. I even asked both of my parents, are you more like your mom or your dad? And they shared a lot of really amazing qualities that I didn't know about my grandparents at the time. Then at the end of the year, StoryWorth compiles all of their answers, puts them into this gorgeous book that covers everything. My parents love showing us their books and I personally love getting a chance to read them. With StoryWorth, I am giving those I love, a thoughtful and personal gift from the heart that preserves their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash NGM and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash NGM to save $10 on your first purchase. We're hitting that time of year where my brain gets so overloaded in December that I look for anything to make life easier. And I have to say, Brie, that Green Chef is one of those services. Yes. Green Chef is there to take away the dreaded, oh my goodness, what are we going to eat for dinner tonight? You can eat clean all holiday long with over 80 weekly meal options each week featuring things like quick and easy, protein packed, calorie smart, or my personal favorite, the keto options. And you don't have to lose track of healthy eating habits during the holidays because every Green Chef customer gets a free session with one of their registered dietitians who can walk you through how to make clean eating work for you, which is very cool. And I have to say that I have been loving their recipes lately. They put things together I have never thought of. This week, we're trying the lemon basil caper pork with sauteed cauliflower, bell peppers, almonds, and feta cheese, my favorite. Their recipes make it so easy to support my wellness goals without skipping on flavor. For Green Chef's best deal of the year, get $250 off with code NGM250 at greenchef.com slash NGM250. That's greenchef.com slash NGM250. And don't forget to use that code NGM250 to get $250 off. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. No. I know, right? Well, I'm also thinking back to you're talking about the body parts. And I just remember being told that narrative that like, well, some girls just don't get pleasure from sex. You're just going to have to deal with that. And I, oh yeah, yeah, that was the narrative, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Brie it was all about the for, men. We're just going to say for a scary long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was a lot about the, right? the faking orgasms, yeah. like would growing up, like, yeah, that's what yeah. women did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you just, you just sort of pretend yeah. it might not be great. And then there's all this mystery and all this shame around, like touch your own clitoris people when you're getting busy, like, hello, <laughs> sex tip. Right. Take care of your own business, right? It's really hard to have an orgasm with the penis in a vagina. If that's what you're doing, if that's what you're doing. And I mean, yeah. you know, it's However. easier to have orgasms other ways. So yeah, I mean, just encouraging again, clitoris havers to understand that they can take control of that and that sex should be pleasurable. And then the penis havers, you know, if we're having heterosexual sex, they should know about the clitoris and they should get <laughs> there and get busy and get to know it, right? And so, and then that reminds me, you know, we're talking about straight sex, right? But you can't tell by looking if your kid is some, you know, something other than straight. So making sure that you're talking about different sexualities and, you know, different ways people have sex, right? So, you know, two folks with, you know, vulvas, they're not going to be having necessarily penis and vagina. (laughs) Sex, right? right they're not. So they're going to be doing yeah. other things, right? Mutual masturbation, oral sex, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I guess sort of my takeaway here is that well, I didn't say this like this, a whole lot of this is just about us and getting our over our own shit, right? Yeah. There's a lot of that that needs to happen. I <laughs> like, know. And, you know, it just sucks because we have sexual trauma and, you know, it's just hard. And so, you know, I say that and I sound really glib, but I really understand understand like there is a chasm between like who we are and where we want to be and how we want to be with our kids. So learning about how to have conversations, clarifying your values, having conversations with people you trust and making, even making a plan and then just start. No one's going to die. No Mm -hmm. one's going to throw up. 
There might be excessive wine drinking if you're a wine drinker, but there it's, it's not going to be as awful and scary as you think it is. Like we make it up to be this huge thing. And, you know, our job is to keep our kids healthy and safe, right? That's it. This is one of the biggest things we do, right? Quite honestly, I would say having the conversation with a preteen teen probably got the same amount of eye rolls and uggs and looking the other way that I got any other conversation I was having. (laughs) Like about, about anything else that they didn't want to hear me talk about. That's true. That's yeah, true. For sure, anything. for sure. Yeah. And that, that those tween years are hard because they're, they're naturally grossed out. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to say like, look, I get it. You're not interested in this, but trust me, most likely in two years, you're going to be like, all right, let's talk about what it. do I know? Let's do it. <laughs> well, it sounds like I, I'm definitely going to get your book because there are a lot of topics that I need to talk about. It's much harder when your kids avoid it. It's so much easier when they're just asking you questions. I feel like. Oh, yeah. And that's a myth. No, that's a myth. It's not their job to ask us questions. It's nope, your job it's not. to give them information. Exactly. Exactly. So I need to get your book. And uh, what else are you, what are you looking forward to right now, Amy? Um, wait a minute. That's a lovely question. Um, I'm looking forward to, I'm doing a bunch of PTA talks. They're all getting scheduled. And I just, you know, summer's hard for me because I'm, you know, I dry up in that department. So I'm very excited to be able to connect and teach. It's my favorite thing to do. I'm looking forward to that. And then I'm just trying to think, and I've been playing pickleball like every other white 55 year old middle-class gal. And it just has been such a joy. I have never had a sport before, so it's been really, really fun. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm in a little tournament on Friday. Ooh, that's exciting. That's awesome. I've never tried pickleball. I keep hearing it come up. It's something I need to try. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Great. Thank you. So the discussion with Amy was so interesting because she's totally right. Like we were not talked with about sex in this way. Oh, no, 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 no. It was like maybe handed the book. Oh, the best I got was, um, and I love you, mom, if you're listening. But uh, I remember when I was a freshman in high school and she just said, you know, we're going to go put you on the pill. I had no idea why. And later my sisters tell me like, oh, yeah, she totally thought you were having sex. So that's why she did that. No conversation. Just here you go. Just here you go. (laughs) And I think that's kind of how things were done. It's funny. I had a friend whose mom was the school nurse and the school nurse also gave the sex ed discussions at her school. Okay. So here she was like in sixth grade and her mom was the one. Oh, that would be so uncomfortable for you as a sixth grader. I could not. I could not imagine. I could not imagine. But I mean, she grew up having a very like frank view of it and just being very comfortable with it. And I would love for my kids to have that too because so much of sex ed is rooted in shame it's like don't do this or this is bad and yeah it shouldn't be no i mean you're right like that is pretty much the go-to system that our our families that our parents had have had for generations of the whole like you don't do it it's bad it's wrong it it but the truth of the matter is we all know it happens. Yeah. We all know it's going to happen. So why not give your kids the knowledge so that they know what they need to do going forward? I would like to always think of like, what would someone in France do? Because, <laughs> you know, because like, they're so they much more the, open-minded. In, they don't have the Europe. same hang-ups over there as we do in America. You know, that, that Puritan background we have over here. Instead of the what would Jesus do, you're like, what, what would, would France, France do? Would and it would totally put you in the France opposite. And, Fran, 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 France, 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 would be like Fran, German. Suges. But yeah, what would France do? And that would put you in the total opposite direction, I think, than most people. We actually <laughs> know some people in France, so maybe we need to ask them. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Amy and you picked up some good scripts to use with your kids. And you're going to go get her book because that has even more scripts for you. I'm going to go get her book. Yes. So am I. Totally. So remember the best mom is a happy mom. Take care of you. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks for stopping by. Are you looking for something to listen to with your whole family? Then check out Six Minutes, produced and created by Gen Z Media. With over 200 twisty, cliffhanger-filled episodes, Six Minutes tells the story of 11-year-old Holiday who was pulled from the icy waters with no memory of who she is or where she came from. 
Three years ago, Brindley Pasternak helped the Anders family uncover the truth about Holiday's past. Now she'll need them to help her find the truth about hers. In Six Minutes Out of Time, the long-awaited sequel, Cyrus Anders is found unconscious near the mysterious Elixir Academy in Florida, and Brindley learns the school may have a shocking connection to her missing mother. Dive in now and get the most downloaded family audio adventure in history. Follow Six Minutes wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free with the GZM family subscription.